Um, and now I'm welcoming uh, Dr. Patrick Harrington, who's going to talk about MPNs and COVID. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to talk today. And also thanks to the organisers for putting on such an excellent programme this uh, last couple of days. So I'm going to talk about COVID-19, which is a topic which is still relevant even two and a half years after coming into all of our lives. So to begin with, what evidence do we have for patients with MPN being at an increased risk of infection in general? We know both the underlying disease process in MPN in many cases, as well as treatments taken to control the disease can both affect normal immune response. And two recent large studies published in the last couple of years have addressed the question of whether patients with MPN are at an increased risk of infection when compared with the general population. The first of these studies looked at over 8,000 patients with MPN, and they reported that these patients had an increased incidence of both bacterial and viral infections when compared with uh, the healthy control population. The second study looked within the MPN population at around 1,000 patients this time, and they found that those with a diagnosis of myelofibrosis in particular, as well as those taking the JAK1 inhibitor, ruxolitinib, were at an increased risk of developing infection. So these studies do go to show that there does seem to be an increased risk of infection in this patient population. Moving on to COVID-19 specifically, and whilst we're aware that outcomes from COVID-19 have improved quite significantly with the development of vaccines in particular, but also changes to the virulence and aggressiveness of new variants, we should note that some patients do continue to experience more severe infection. And that's demonstrated by the data on this slide. So this comes from an analysis of over 30,000 patients and these are patients with blood cancer of any type and they're a vaccinated population. And what they showed was that these patients had an increased incidence of both hospitalization and severe infection when compared with healthy controls. And that's demonstrated by the graphs, by the graphs here, which uh, the patient population is shown by the blue line. So this just really serves as a reminder that whilst we have continued to see improvements in the um, outcomes from COVID-19, some caution is still warranted with this infection. So moving on to look at MPN patients in particular, and whether MPN patients are at an increased risk of COVID-19. And there have been two reports on this from the same pan-European study, which reported, uh, which collected patients from 39 centres across seven different countries, including the UK. They looked at 175 patients in the first wave, and then 304 patients in the second wave. And what they found was that in the first wave of COVID-19, patients with MPN did have an increased risk of COVID-19 infection. And they looked at the particular risk factors and found the normal suspects in advanced age, male sex, and also they found that discontinuation of the JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib was also associated with worse outcomes. And that was thought to be because ruxolitinib may control the hyperinflammatory storm that's observed in certain cases of severe infection. They then looked at outcomes in the second wave, and the interesting finding here was that there were significant improvements in the outcomes in people with MPN with active COVID-19 infection. And this was attributed primarily due to improved diagnostics, as well as better preparedness of healthcare systems. But also there was likely to be a significant effect of vaccines in this second wave analysis, although that wasn't specifically addressed in this study. So moving on to some of the research that we've performed in our lab, and we focused specifically at the immune response following infection initially. And we looked at the T cell response. So T cells are a type of white blood cell that can detect other infected cells and then can target and kill these cells. And we focused on this because um, T cells firstly are much less well studied than antibodies in terms of the response to COVID-19 infection and vaccination, but also there's evidence for a significant decline in the antibody response in the first few months after infection, whereas T cells are supposed to offer a more durable response. And we were indeed able to show this in our patient population with MPN so we showed that patients with MPN were able to mount a T-cell response on re-exposure to SARS-CoV-2 up to six months after an initial infection. And this is demonstrated using a technique called flow cytometry. And some of the graphs demonstrating this are shown here on the right. So you can see each of these tiny dots here represents an individual patient's T-cell that's mounting a response to proteins from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, including the spike protein shown here. And what we have up here is a negative control sample, which is not exposed to any proteins from SARS-CoV-2 with no reaction. So quite convincing evidence for an, an immune response against COVID-19, even six months after an initial infection in these patients with MPN 
who in many cases were taking disease modifying treatments that could not, we expect could potentially uh, compromise in immune function. So reassuring results. We then went on to look at the response to vaccination and we looked at the response to a first dose of vaccine and there were two studies that addressed this. The first was our study from Guy's and St. Thomas's, which looked at a small number of patients with NPN, just 21 in total, but included patients across each diagnostic subtype, including ET, PV, and myelofibrosis. And we demonstrated an antibody response rate of over 80%, as well as a T cell response rate um, in similar numbers. So good reassuring results to a single dose of vaccine, and that's patients who are receiving the Pfizer vaccine. The second study was performed by the Oxford group, and they looked at a slightly larger um, uh, population of patients, so 60 patients in total, and they focused on an antibody response and reported a, a slightly lower response rate of around 58%. Interestingly, they also looked, compared the response rates that observed in a group of healthcare support workers who were age-matched to the patient population, and they found that patients with myeloid neoplasms had an inferior response rate compared with those uh, age-matched healthy controls. Then moving on to the uh, analysis in my lab after a second dose of vaccine, we looked at a slightly larger population here of 61 patients in total, with 37 having a diagnosis of uh, MPN. Again, we reported response rates of around 80 to 90% overall. And some of the interesting findings at this time point were that we observed an improved antibody response in those patients with evidence of previous infection. So that's in keeping with the cumulative response in terms of antibodies after infection and vaccination. And we also observed that those patients receiving the Pfizer BNT162B2 vaccine had a greater antibody response than those receiving the Chadox1 Oxford vaccine. Um, so that was quite informative at the time after two doses. More recently, we've published data on the response to a third dose of vaccine. And some interesting points to note here were a significantly increased T cell response after a third dose of vaccine when compared with the second dose. That data is shown here. And this is particularly important as we recognize that T cells are able to provide better infection against uh, protection against novel variants than antibodies, which are more able to target the uh, initial strain that the vaccine was designed to, to protect against. We also observed after three doses that patients um, after a third dose were more likely to have presence antibodies which are able to neutralize the Omicron variants. So after a third dose, we saw that nearly all patients had detectable antibodies able to neutralize this Omicron variant, whereas after a second dose, only around two thirds of patients had presence of these uh, Omicron neutralizing antibodies. So another important finding. Throughout our research, we've also assessed the impact of diagnosis as well as treatments on the resp response to vaccination in our patient cohort. So after both two and three doses of vaccine, we observed that patients with myelofibrosis had an inferior immune response compared to those with ET and PV diagnoses. And that's in keeping with the greater degree of immune suppression that's frequently seen in patients with myelofibrosis. And the data for a T cell response is shown here with the slightly inferior response observed in this myelofibrosis population. We then also observed that patients taking the JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib had a slightly inferior antibody and T cell response when compared with patients taking other treatments. Uh, data for T cell response is shown here for ruxolitinib compared with those patients taking other treatments. And again, this is unsurprising given the significant immunosuppressive effects that are recognized with this medication. I'll just briefly touch on this uh, data that we also have, which um, is relevant as a very small proportion of patients with MPN go on to require allogeneic stem cell transplantation. So I'll mention this data uh, in this patient population who are particularly immune suppressed due to the requirement for, me requirement for medications which control and uh, their T cells to prevent against things like graft versus host disease. So there are patient population who are recognized to be immune suppressed and were feared would have a, a, an inadequate response to vaccination. And what we found was indeed that after a first dose of vaccine, the antibody and T cell response was fairly low. Um, and that's demonstrated for antibodies in the graph here. So the mean antibody levels after a first dose were, were quite low. However, the interesting finding was that after a second dose, there was a significant increase in both antibody levels and T cells. Uh, and that's demonstrated here for anti-spike IgG antibodies, as well as for neutralizing antibodies here. 
So just a brief public service announcement. I'm sure that everyone in the room is ahead of me on this, but I should mention that the Autumn Booster Programme has been available since September for COVID vaccination. And this is available regardless of how many previous doses of vaccine you've had, which I'm told can be up to six in some cases. The only requirement is it has to be greater than three months from your last dose of vaccine. And the vaccine that's currently being offered is the Moderna bivalent mRNA vaccine. So this targets both the original strain as well as the Omicron variant, which is the BA1 subtype for those interested in such things. And this can be booked online or via calling 119. So I'll just touch on some other preventative measures aside from vaccination. And one study assessed the impact of the intramuscular injection of two monoclonal antibodies, which target the spike protein, better known as Evusheld. This was evaluating a group of over 3,000 patients who are considered to be at increased risk of an inadequate response to vaccination. However, it should be noted they're not cancer patients. What they did was compare the outcomes following administration of this injection with that observed in a group, a group who received placebo. And they found that patients receiving Evusheld had lower rates of development of COVID-19 in the six months after administration. And that data is demonstrated here below. So the blue line represents those patients receiving placebo and the red line represents those receiving Evusheld, and that's the percentage of patients developing active COVID-19. More clearly shown on the inset graph here with an enlarged y-axis, and you can see the significant difference between the two groups. And in addition to preventative measures, we do also have some treatments available now, which, is, which have demonstrated efficacy in the management of COVID-19. And both of these studies have been reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. So firstly, the monoclonal neutralizing antibody citrovimab was compared with placebo in almost 600 patients with symptomatic COVID-19. And this demonstrated a reduction in the rate of hospitalizations in patients receiving this treatment when compared with placebo. And secondly, the antiviral treatment near Maltrelvir, which is better known as Paxlovid, was also compared with placebo in over 2,000 patients. And again, this treatment showed a significant reduction in progression to severe COVID-19. However, however, we should note that both of these treatments were evaluated and reported on here in unvaccinated populations. And as such, we have to interpret these results with caution when applying them to our vaccinated population. Um, however, these, these results are promising and do encourage us with regards to treatment of active COVID-19 in those patients considered to have had a suboptimal response to vaccination, which is where these treatments should be targeted. So what remaining questions do we have left with regards to COVID-19? As yet, we still don't know fully the durability of the immune response that vaccination against COVID-19 provides. However, it seems likely that we will continue to require ongoing annual booster, uh, boosters against COVID-19 targeting any dominant variant at the time in a similar manner that we do with the flu vaccine currently. And on that note, we can't accurately predict what will happen with regards to the development of new variants. And whilst we may continue to observe these less severe infections, there's always the possibility of a new variant that could be more aggressive. And we still wait to see whether we'll continue to observe significant seasonal variation as we do with other viral illnesses. Uh, and one other important reminder is whilst we focus so much on COVID-19, we should also remember the importance of maintaining vaccination against other infectious illnesses, particularly flu, as we're very much now in flu season. Um, as well as um, vaccination against shingles, which people in their 70s would be eligible for. And patients with MPN should receive the non-live version of, uh, of the vaccine for this, which is called Shingrix. So I'd just like to finish off by thanking all the patients and their relatives who've helped support our research over the last couple of years at GSTT and in, in other centres, as well as support from MPN Voice and Blood Cancer UK and my colleagues who've helped me with, my, with the research that we've performed. We're taking the questions. I'm just saying a huge thank you to Patrick. Um, and um, I'll let you into a secret. I was patient 58, so I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you.